Welcome to the Prison Professors Podcast. I am Michael Santos, and I'm really thrilled to introduce you to my partner, the co-founder of Prison Professors, Justin Paperni. Justin, thanks so much for being on the program this early morning. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Well, I would like to do, I would like to reserve this entire episode to let our audience and listeners know a lot about you. Now, of course, anybody can visit our prison professor's website and click on your biography and read a lot about your illustrious career. But for some people who may be driving down the road, listen to this on, on their favorite podcasting system or uh, watching us on YouTube, I'd like them to know a little bit about you. So first of all, why don't we start off and talk about what you are doing right now? What is your role with our organization right now? Well, my role with, well, thank you again. My role with prison professors is to work alongside you and Sean to help more people and organizations traverse the system successfully. Specifically, I oversee and manage our, our consulting and our consulting team and run a lot of the marketing that helps promote the products and services and content that you've spent uh, 30 years or so creating. There's a lot of content and it's a lot of work to make sure that it gets in front of the right people so they know how it can help them. So marketing consulting is my primary role at pr uh, prison professors. Well, one of the things that we really focus on is the importance of people who are coming into the system or going through the system or coming home from the system, the importance of rebranding themselves. And you've become somewhat of an expert at that. Um, we know that you're currently working with us, mm -hmm. but you didn't always start working in the prison space. So why don't we branch back and, and talk to us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, what you studied, and what your career aspirations were before you got involved in, in working with us. Thank you. So I grew up in Encino, California, which is just outside of Los Angeles. I was a good student in school, but my primary interest as a young man was baseball. Uh, I had the privilege of playing in the Pony World Series, the Babe Ruth World Series, and those skills took me through USC, where I was a proud member of the USC baseball team. We lost in the national championship game in 1995. So I love baseball, and it really uh, conditioned me for hard work and discipline and just teamwork. I loved it. Uh, I graduated USC in 1997 with a degree in psychology. I wanted to go to graduate school. And then randomly one day, my mom mentioned that I had a cousin, a distant cousin, who was a manager, a managing director at Goldman Sachs. She said, why don't you go learn from him? I said, fine. I showed up at his office in downtown Los Angeles on uh, Grand Street at 3 a.m. And I was hooked hearing 50, $100 million bond trades. And I knew as soon as I walked into that trading floor at Goldman Sachs, I wanted to be a money manager. And I spent the rest of my time at USC interning at Prudential and Merrill Lynch. And when I graduated USC, I accepted a position at Merrill Lynch in Orange County. And how long did you work in the financial services industry? So I started May of 1997, and it ended December 15th, 2005, when my branch manager at UBS called me in to question my actions in facilitating some decisions for a client's hedge fund. So for about eight years. So we're talking to Justin Paperni, a former stockbroker, graduate of USC, who's also a co-founder of the Prison Professors Organization. And he's talking with us a little bit about what it's like to go through a, uh, a life as a financial services professional and then eventually finding himself he was the target of a criminal organization. What was it like for you, Justin, to have never been experienced or exposed to the criminal justice system before and all of a sudden finding out that you potentially could be going inside for a free room and board? Well, I was so overwhelmed and underprepared. And my experience, I lived in a great deal of denial. So even when people tried to help me, I, I would avoid them. So for me, in December of 2005, when I learned that my actions were under scrutiny, my senior business partner, others who were a little wiser, had more experience, or I shouldn't say wiser, weren't in denial like me. They, let, they lawyered up. They began making better decisions. In my case, uh, I lied to UBS when they questioned me. I spent fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 initially hiring lawyers who couldn't properly prepare me because I didn't speak openly and honestly with them. And in retrospect, part of that was because I still wanted them to see me as a USC baseball player, a stockbroker, a successful executive. I didn't want them to view me as someone who could play a role in turning investors into victims. So for a number of those reasons, for two years, I went down this horrific path of gaining weight, of eating poorly, of lying to my family, lying to lawyers, beginning to use my home like it's an ATM to pay these lawyers. And inevitably, all of those bad decisions, longer prison term, eventually pleading guilty to securities charges. And in, in retrospect, 
the three and a half years I spent fighting my case, I already felt like I was in prison. I just wasn't getting credit for it. So in retrospect, I have such regret over how I handled that really first test of adversity in my life. And um, that's why when you met me in prison, you could see how down and broken and beaten I was as a young man because I had let so many people down and I just had so many regrets. I was ill prepared to handle my experience, to put it lightly. And when you went into the prison system, what kind of thoughts did you have about how you would emerge? What were you thinking about? Well, when this gets over, this is what I'm going to do with my life. Tell us a little bit about what your expectations were after the journey. Well, when I met you, I couldn't even start. So I remember meeting you a couple of days into prison. I said, okay, Michael, nice to meet you. Let me tell you what I want to do. Uh, I spent a million dollars on my case. I want to get my money back. I lost on my licenses. I want to build a new career. I was a USC athlete. I put on 40 pounds. I'm fat, bloated, miserable. I want to be in shape by tomorrow. I've really upset my family. My mom's going to therapy because of me. My parents think it's their fault because I had too much privilege as a kid. You know, I want my parents to love me again. And it, and I wanted all of it that first day. And I because I wanted so much and I, I had done so much harm, I didn't know where to start. So even in those initial days, frankly, until you began mentoring me, I continued to remain lost and um, really off my game. And it wasn't until you said, what is one thing that we can do today? What does incremental daily progress mean? And then I began to slowly get on track working alongside you 12 hours a day. I was fortunate to have you as a mentor. We try to be mentor for those going through the system. It changed my life. I, I like to think since we've been doing this for a long time, it's changing the lives of others. But my initial concern was I wanted it all back the first day. And it's sort of like the decisions I made as a securities broker where I wanted to get perhaps in two years where it takes 10. I really had to embrace, this is going to take some time to do it the right way. And you had been doing that for 22 years when I shook your hand. Well, Let's talk more. Let's just, let's focus really on your vision. Yep. Tell us about your vision when you walked in. Cause I think a lot of people who go into the prison system, you know, they're thinking it's a temporary type of a situation. You know, at the other end of the sentence, you know, life is going to resume as normal. I'd like to hear from you before you and I spoke, before yes. we spoke about the complexities and the ancillary consequences that come with a criminal conviction and a, and a journey in prison. What did you think your life would be like on the other side of the journey when you finally got out of prison before we started working? Sure. So I was in denial enough to think that my life would continue uninterrupted. For example, I sold real estate successfully in Calabasas for more than three years before I surrendered. My license was active. My conviction was as a securities broker. So I had people telling me, well, of course, you're going to be able to resume your real estate career not knowing you have a conviction, there's still outstanding restitution, probably going to lose your license. My only goal when I surrendered to prison, and frankly, until I met you, was to lose some weight. And I said, I'll, yeah, I took Spanish all the way through USC. Maybe I'll increase my, you know, learn a second language. All I wanted to do was lose weight, and I was going to exercise for 10 hours a day to accomplish that goal. I presume when I went home, because it was only a year, people, I had an 18-month sentence, but I was going to be away a year, 15 months. It's like, how can that really change your life? And then I began to see prisoners going home, nervous, afraid, with very little lined up. And they had been watching TV all day and not really preparing. And one of the best experience, one of the greatest learning lessons is when I ran into your cubicle one day and said, dude, I just ran 10 miles and you did 15, I did 15 pull-ups. And you were like, that's great. Are people going to hire you and pay you to do pull-ups? Because all I had done was exercise all day. So my initial goal when I surrendered to prison was decompress, recalibrate a bit, get fit, nothing else. And so there was no that. thought about your life when you'd get out of prison. When you started, it was just about let's just get through prison and get fit. But there, you, didn't, you didn't put a lot of thought. And you just thought it'd be very easy to get back into the real estate. You, you're you're fighting. You're, it's very hard to think about the end, life after prison, because you've been, I've been consumed with my case for years. You can't think about the other side before you've even gone to, to jail. Lawyers and the Department of Justice and sentencing and press releases and losing friends and money. And it's like, how can you even begin to think about the other side when you haven't even entered, entered the system? So no, I did absolutely zilch nothing to think about the other side. And when I did, I just convinced myself everything would be all good. You said something else that interested me. You said that you were arrested, I think you, I don't remember what day, I think you said it was around 2008, but then yeah. you said 
that you, you work for three years as a, secure, as a real estate broker after you left the securities industry. How long did it take from the day that you learned you were the target of an investigation or could be the, tar the target of an investigation until the day that you actually began your term in prison? How long was that? Yes, the, the hardest part of my life, December 15th, 2005, it began and I surrendered to prison April 28th, 2008. So just over three years. So for three years, this was hanging over you like a dark cloud where although you were able to uh, earn a living through real estate, I got to think that your life was kind of, uh, what do you tell us? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, what was your was, life uh, like during those three years? It was, it was nearly unbearable in retrospect. I, I, I wonder at days how I, how I got through it. From the morning, from the second I woke up, all I would think about was my, my case. I would be afraid to sit down at my computer to see emails that would come from lawyers, letters that would come in from uh, investors turned victims, the fallout to my family and community and my parents. And I couldn't, I could hardly... A great part of that time, I could hardly function, and, I, and I'm, I'm not even embarrassed to say that. I had never dealt with any setback like this in my life. And I remember some days, Tuesday at 11 a.m., driving to downtown Los Angeles to meet my excellent lawyers, thinking, my friends are building businesses right now. They're contributing to their communities. Instead, I'm going down to meet with lawyers to tell them half-truths about my role as a securities broker. And I lived that path for more than, than three years. I didn't go to family events. My, my mom would send me your blogs, read Michael Santos. He's at Taft where you may go. And I said, I don't want to read Michael Santos. I don't want to read his blogs and I ain't going to meet him when I get to jail. I would delete it. I wouldn't even look at it. I was in such denial. So occasionally some people knock my 18 months in jail and I remind them it wasn't 18 months. It was 18 months I served plus the three and a half years I spent fighting my case which was the hardest part. The, the, punish, the process was the punishment. That's an important lesson, I think, for many of the people who are listening to the Prison Professors podcast and, and anybody who's going into the system is that that time prior to imprisonment can bring that fear of the unknown, that sense of your life is spinning out of control. And yet, while you, from what I heard otherwise, and really from what I know personally, it seemed that you used your time in prison to recalibrate and to set yourself on a path. Even though you weren't thinking about it when you went in, you found opportunities to grow and to develop. And, and I'd love it if you just you know, spent a minute or two telling us how you did that. So um, um, fortunately, I, I do have a competitive side to me and I'm not afraid of even embarrassment or rejection. Baseball conditioned me for such levels of rejection. So when I began spending time alongside you and opening up about my family, you began to ask me questions about my conduct and my case. And even initially, I was misleading you. And, and you said, Justin, we're, we're friends. I'm in prison. I want to help you. I want to guide you. But you have to tell, speak openly to me. Help me understand why you crossed this line. And once I began to do that, this whole like ocean opened up. You began to, I was reading the John Grisham books. And you said, hey, dude, that's cool. But you might as well be in the TV room right now watching a movie. It's the same thing. It's a very passive activity. What books are you reading and moreover, how are they going to help you lead the life you want to live after you get out of prison? That was such a profound question. I couldn't answer it. So once I began to learn and read and frankly, for the first time, be held to account, that was the key thing for me. You, my family, my, one of my best friends, Brad Fulmer, who you know well, who supports our work, who played in the major leagues for nine or 10 years, would show up at visitation and say, what did you do this week? You're going to be home soon. What is the path? What is the plan? Initially, I couldn't answer. It was, dude, I don't know. I'm in jail. I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting uh, adjusted. So once mentors like you and Brad and others began to hold me accountable, I began to focus on day-to-day -day tasks. What could I do tomorrow? And you used to say to me, Justin, if you do the same thing today, where will you be in a year, in two and three years? And that, frankly, began to consume, consume me. I began to wake up early, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., work alongside you and learn. I became obsessed with the process and really recalibrate and developing new values. I no longer wanted to be a cliche, Michael. I didn't want to say family was important, but I didn't nurture family. I didn't want to say education was important or character, but do nothing. So you helped me, as much as anything, identify my values and then live faithfully to them. And I did it each and every day until I was released. And, um, and I began doing it when I was released from prison. Ironically, even though you were still in prison upon my release, email had come in and we were writing. 
that was the big change for me. I identified my values. You held me accountable, and I began to live faithfully to them. And it changed, um, and I still live faithfully to them now. So through that work resulted in a, a well-documented journey of the time that you served in prison. Um, Justin is the author of uh, Lessons, Lessons from Prison and, and other books that helped him launch his career. Tell us a little bit about what, I mean, you went home in 2009, at the time that we were in one of the greatest recessions of our lifetime. Tell us how your preparations in prison uh, contributed to the life you experienced when you went home. Well, let me quickly talk, talk to the book, because in prison one time you were teaching a class and you asked the prisoners to raise your hand if you want to write a book, and everyone raised their hand, and you said, well, how many have actually written a book, and nobody's hands went up? So I asked you one day, I think I'd like to do that someday, maybe write a book, and you said, why don't you start with small steps? So then we began writing a, a blog together, and it felt good for the first time to help people. I was actually thinking of others. Then one day while walking to the chow hall, I said, dude, I got all of these letters from people reading this blog. Thank you so much for helping me. It felt good to contribute and give back. And the blog was the harbinger for, for a book. So rather than going to prison, I encouraged those watching and saying, I want to do the book and lose 50 pounds and rebuild my family and build a $10 million business. All of those are great goals. You know, what can you do today? It started my working next to you in a quiet room saying, I want to write a piece with you today that might help someone who's in trouble like me going through this process. And that first step led to a lot of, well, upon my release in 2009, I mentioned I wasn't afraid of rejection with the book that you helped me write, Lessons from Prison. I knew that I could help more white collar defendants do this journey better than me. I don't think it's only white collar. You help people from every level. Every, but what I did is the first day that I got out of jail, I, with a suit that I wore to sentencing that was now too huge because I'd lost 30 pounds in prison, I began cold walking all throughout downtown Los Angeles with lessons from prison. Uh, Mark Worksman, Alan Eisner, lawyers who now support and endorse our work, I would just try to get into their office like I was a cold walking 22 year old stockbroker again. And I had a part of a benefit of going to prison is I feared much less. After all, I'd already been to jail. So the rejection didn't bother me. But in 2009, with bills to pay, with restitution, I had to work hard. I had to use my experience wisely. So I did that by reaching out to criminal defense attorneys. The work that we had put in in prison with the blog and the book really did help because I had three clients my first month from defendants who had been reading my blog. And then I also wanted to speak to universities and businesses about the consequences of unethical conduct. So I began reaching out to professors like USC, my alma mater, Cal State Northridge. And eventually those speeches led to events with uh, the FBI, USC, KPMG, New York University, and others. But it all started with how can I begin to help others for the first time? But I worked at it. You used to end messages to me that would say, work, work, work. I, I, work, I woke early, I work late. And um, those efforts, despite, it's hard to walk into a lawyer's office and to be thrown out. It's hard to be looked at from others saying, what the hell is this guy doing cold walking into our office? Uh, but, I, but I did it. And I believed in the message more than I ever did sell in stocks. I believed and I did not want other defendants to endure my journey and respond as I did. Because this process is harder on family and loved ones. And I just didn't realize that, Michael, until I met you or until I was in prison. The real takeaway there, I think, for any listener is that, you know, the sooner an individual starts, uh, I guess, owning decisions and becoming authentic, uh, that, the sooner that individual can start sowing seeds for a better outcome. And I'm, I'm really happy to, to see the development that you've, that you've made since we first met and the contributions that you make to the lives of others. Justin is not only the uh, director of marketing and sales with, with prison professors, but he's also the, uh, the, the, the director and marketing of White Collar Advice, which has is, which is worked with how many people, Justin, in the, over the course of the several years that you've been working? How many clients have you say that you have worked with? Well, we've had our team, we've had hundreds and hundreds of, of, of clients worked with personally, of course, many others have downloaded as you as you frequently love to say, we give away more, we give away more stuff than, than we sell. So we're giving away lesson plans and, and books and case studies to help others traverse this system. So personally, we worked one on one with hundreds, but tens of thousands of people have come across our work and our videos and lesson plans. I frequently put prospects and clients on the phone with other prospects and clients to, to learn, to ensure that we do exactly what we say we're, we're going to do. So 
Um, we have the privilege of helping a lot of people for, for a long time. And I think working with you and Sean and our team, uh, it's only going to grow and go into new markets beyond just the prison space, right? The lessons that you taught me, the lessons that guided you for 26 years and guided me that I've used to guide our clients, I think can help anyone going through a sense of struggle, whether it's weight loss or divorce or depression, that they're timeless lessons. And I began to learn them in prison and follow it through every day. And that's the last thing or what I, what I want to convey. Everyone says they, they want it and then they want a better life. They want that success. It's that daily implementation that gets it there, small bite-sized pieces. And I think that's the, the best lesson that you shared with me, holding myself accountable every day. You know, we never ask anybody to do anything or say anything or pursue any path that we did not pursue while we were going through the same struggle and that we're not continuing to, to execute that model today. And so by being 100% authentic and inviting people to, to judge us and, and, and uh, assess whether, you know, we're telling anybody to do anything that we didn't do, you know, I think that that brings a lot of relevance to the table and it shows people just by listening to you that regardless of what struggle a person's going through today that bears that has no bearing on what that individual can become tomorrow and uh tell tell our audience a little bit about what you've learned from working from hundreds of people who are encountering the criminal justice system for the first time whether it's a white collar offender or any other offender because every person is a human being mm -hmm. and all of them facing this have enormous struggle how, what, what did you learn from working with so many of those people? I've learned that the, the capacity of people to, to overcome is, is amazing, that sometimes people don't know what they're capable of until they're actually going through it. I've learned that it can be incredibly difficult for some defendants to go to prison, uh, especially when their case was gray or civil or it, civil sanction. It should have been at worst, but they were pursued. Um, for me, it was very, it was easier to go to prison because I did it. I crossed the line. It wasn't hard to read my Department of Justice press releases be, because I did it. For, for clients who don't feel as if, okay, I did something wrong, but maybe it shouldn't, I shouldn't be going to prison, their will to overcome and to prepare and to recognize this is harder in my family and those that love and support me. I, I want to set the tone. I want to leave a legacy for my children that this isn't going to define our family in a, in a bad way, but a good way by how I'm responding. So I've seen some incredible stories and everyone that has succeeded, it's because rather than talk about what, what they want to do, like you wrote, a, you wrote at the end of Lessons from Prison, if you say you're going to say something, do it. It's not just talking about what they want to do. It's actually enduring the struggle and the process to, to make it happen, whether it's waking early, whether it's nurturing and growing your network from prison, writing that probation officer, doing the initial job out of jail that you may not want to do that's part of that five-year plan that you often speak to. Uh, you asked me in prison, what job would you do? And initially it was, I don't know, I want a job that's worthy of my skill set. And you helped me understand this is a stepping stone. Prove worthy, build your reputation, become a law-abiding citizen. So to answer your question, it's not just talking about the end game and what you want. It's those that are successful are willing to endure that process and the struggle and even find some joy in it. Like I found joy in getting thrown out of a lawyer's office when I cold called. Or the first lecture I ever did, Michael, at USC, my God, it was awful. There was three students sleeping in the front row, and I felt terrible that they were paying this type of tuition at USC to hear a speaker put them to sleep. But I say, okay, it's part of the process. I'm getting better. So those that succeed are willing to endure that process and struggle and even find some joy in it. And we've had the pleasure of helping hundreds get through it. Just don't talk about it. You got to do it. So I know that, that part of the work that you do is the one-on-one -on -one work with individuals, mm -hmm. but let's talk to a broader audience now for people who are like you were at the beginning of the journey and, and they may not be throwing away the blog. They may be driving down the road right now and, and they're in that same space where they've been hearing about you know, challenges from the criminal justice are coming down the pike. What would you advise that person if he's not ready to talk to anybody, but he still wants to do better, he still wants to be thinking, give us a little advice for that individual. So slow and steady win, wins the race. Part of the reason we give away so many resources from big books to small books to lesson plans is if you can begin to spend five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day listening to our podcast, reading our case studies, reading our blogs, you'll begin to see what's truly possible through this process. Uh, part of our goal is to, I think you and Sean epitomize what's capable or what's 
possible with a felony conviction, you have debunked so many of the misperceptions that exist with people who have been to prison. You were a professor the day you got out of prison. John's a professor at Georgetown Law School. Both of you have traveled and lectured all over the country. You wrote books and made millions from prison. Really, it's debunking much of what you think is possible, learning from those who have actually done it with a documented record, because anyone can say they have done it. Anyone can do a YouTube video. Anyone could write a blog. Is there evidence? Or is there, is there a record of it? So I would say to those of you who are not ready to schedule a call with me, who are not even yet ready to invest in any of our products, if you want it bad enough, okay, can you spend five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day? And through that process, it will become more, it will become greater, and you'll learn what is, can be a great experience in your life. This has turned out to be a phenomenal experience in my life, despite the millions of dollars I spent in losing my licenses and the Department of Justice press releases. Uh, it's turned out to be a, a wonderful experience, and I'm not crazy. It's it's the truth. And had I not met you and began learning from you, I'm not sure I would be here. And others who work with us will have that benefit, will have that opportunity. So for those of you who aren't ready to to talk to me and hear me ramble on a bit, listen to the podcast every day. And if you want to speak with other clients of ours who are in a similar spot, we could have you on the phone with ten clients by five p.m. Not selling you. But telling you how they got started. You have so to start. You, 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 I know that you're as the you've worked a lot with white collar professional people, mm -hmm. but you've also worked with people who are just experiencing the criminal justice for the first time and they really don't know what to do. But I'd like to ask you just the last question. Sure. Do you notice any differences from perhaps somebody who we, we would we could use the, the category white collar offender? Does that person have any unique um, perspectives on the system versus somebody that, well, that does not, does not fall into that category from your experience of, of coaching and mentoring people? Well, from speaking from my experience, um, are there any differences? Sometimes it, it's a little harder to see what they might have done as, as criminal, and it can be harder for them to endure time and um, white collar defendants tend to rationalize a little bit. So some of the work that, that I do is, well, you helped me was, well, what were some of the motivations behind your decisions? How did, how did we get here? Because it's very tough to move forward, Michael, and really become successful if you haven't fully accepted responsibility for, for your conduct, or at least for some of your decisions. For you, you said it started when you were 23 in a Pierce County jail reading Socrates. It's never too late. Perhaps you wish you did it before you went to trial, but it's never too late to begin. So I have found white collar defendants, some of them initially can a little, be a little bit in denial as I was, but once they take the time to learn and study and own some of their decisions, the whole world opens up and they can not run from this experience. And I'll say running from this experience, in my opinion, is not an option. I'm not saying you have to write a blog or a book as we did, but people will admire you and um, thank you for having the courage to speak openly to them about what you did. And I work with our, we work with our clients to help them tell their story, to, to own their story. You don't have to tell the story and say, I agree that I should have gone to prison, but if you worked out of some gray areas, address it. So, or if you truly believe you've done nothing wrong and you were, you were wrongly convicted, let's own it and talk about it. So white collar defendants succeed when they can tell their story openly and honestly and in a way that inspires people to say, hey, you took a hit and you came back strong. Um, okay, what, what type of work can we do together? And I have scores of, we have scores of case, case studies of people who have done that. Um, and it's hard work. It comes back to what I said a few minutes ago. You've got to embrace the process and even the struggle that accompanies this because it's, nothing's easy. But the, the end is coming. Let me just close with that. At some point, you're going to be on the other side of prison boundaries and you're going to be home and you're going to be now what that now what question is coming prepare for that now whether it's a white collar defendant or a drug offender or a sex offender regardless the we're coming home from prison the end is coming you have got to work at it every single day to become great well i'm i want to say to anybody who's listening to this that for me it's an incredible honor to be working with justin he was uh you know for anybody who considers himself a teacher or a professor to see us as somebody that was a student become a professor as well it's uh, not too different from when you said Socrates was my mentor. His uh, student was Plato, and you know they, they taught each other. And now when I listen to you, I feel very much like I'm listening to myself. So if anybody talks to the both of us, and it sounds like we're speaking um, really in sync, it's because we've worked so long together. 
And I just want to say I couldn't be working with a, a better person that I wholly endorse. And I, I am grateful to you for, for working with, uh, with our team and for the leadership that you provide. And I hope that other people will continue to listen and learn from you as, as we continue to develop and build our brand. But I hope most of the way, the big takeaway from listening to Justin Paperni is that regardless of where you are today, you can always begin sowing seeds for a better life. He's a fundamentally different person from the person I, I initially encountered when he walked into prison. And I hope that others who listen and learn from Justin will have that same transformative experience. And um, are there any final words that you'd like to say to our audience before we close out this episode, Justin? Uh, find, find mentors like Michael and me, be held accountable. It's, it's easy to say you want to get somewhere. The question is, do you want to endure the, the process, the learning, and the enjoyment that comes along with that's the best lesson you taught me. So just don't talk about it, do it, and let me hold you accountable along the way with metrics, with weekly accountability logs. Till this day, friends and family will text me and say, thank God you met Michael Santos. No joke. And I'm um, very thankful for that and to be working alongside you. Find those mentors and enjoy the process because it can be a wonderful experience. It may sound crazy as you're driving in your car to work. I know it, it can be a wonderful experience if you, if, uh, if you embrace the process. I know it. I'm living it every single day. Well, it's a mutual feeling. And for those who are uh, listening to the program, this was episode number three of the Prison Professors podcast. And I really just wanted to provide this full introduction to Justin so that you would know who my partners are. Uh, episode two is, is Sean Hopwood. And uh, all future episodes are really we're going to be either interviewing others who are formerly incarcerated that came back successfully, or we'll be dispensing lessons for free. So hope you stay tuned with Prison Professors Podcast. That's it for this episode. I am Michael Santos with Justin Paperni, and we want to thank you for, for participating. Thank you.